with us. No other found. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 61. Psalm 61, if you'd like to follow along. Uh, This is a psalm of David. David writes, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you hear our cries, that you listen to our prayers. God, that we can come to you when we are afraid, when we, we can come to you when we need refuge. We can come to you when we need a strong tower to fight our enemies. God, we thank you that it is your goodness and your faithfulness that allows us to dwell in your tent forever. God, we thank you that 
you are the one that holds our life in your hands. God, we thank you that you are the one that has set David in this time, God, but ultimately Jesus is king over all and that his kingdom will reign forever. And so, Lord, this morning we sing your praises. We lift up your name. And God, we pray that you would help us to follow you in the way that we have said we want to, Lord. We thank you for saving us by your grace, by Jesus. And we ask for your help to follow in obedience, Lord. God, we pray that you would lead us to a rock that is higher than we are. And God, while we we think about that, we know that you are the great rock, Lord. We confess that so many times we seek refuge in things that are less than you, God. Lord, we confess that often we seek refuge and and put our hope in in our government, Lord. Or God, maybe we put our health, our hope in our wealth, Lord, or in our own strength, our our own health, Lord, our own ability, God, there are so many things that we can run to for safety and security that are less than you. And God, we confess our tendency to do that and pray that you would forgive, knowing that you are faithful and you do forgive, Lord. And so we pray that you would help us to run to you in all things, God. Lord, we pray that you would give us the help that we need, Lord, that you would prolong our lives, that you would help us to endure in all generations, God. And Lord, we just think of the many people in our church right now that are struggling, Lord, with with health, with with cancer, uh, Lord, with um, just sickness, with surgeries that are coming up, Lord. We we pray that you would work in a mighty way, Lord, that you would give them grace, that you would heal them, Lord, God, that they would feel your presence and your nearness. God, we pray for um, our government, Lord, that they would rule according to your will, Lord, that they would rule with righteousness and and godly justice, Lord. And so we pray for President Biden and for Governor Newsom, Lord, for um, the Congress and the Supreme Court, Lord, for our state houses, God. We pray for our mayors, Lord. We pray that you would help them, that you would work in their hearts to desire the things of your kingdom, Lord, and not to desire the things of a worldly kingdom, Lord. God, we pray for those that keep us safe, Lord, for the officers that walk our streets and and fight evil, God, we pray that you would keep them safe as they do their work. Ultimately, O Lord, we pray that you would build your kingdom. And so we pray for the churches in our area that are preaching the gospel this morning, Lord, that it would be preached clearly, that it would be heard. And God, that you would build your kingdom as people would turn to you in faith, that they would ask for their sins to be forgiven. And Lord, that they would become their child. Lord, we pray that you would build your kingdom this morning. And Lord, we love you. And as we continue to worship through our offering, we pray that it would be used with wisdom for your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Still my soul
Would you guys stand with us as we continue in worship together? time you can be seated and children first second and third grade are dismissed for adventure club over at the double doors what a wonderful truth that christ will hold us fast i'm so glad for his faithfulness when i so af- so often am, am unfaithful and so we appreciate that fact that christ will hold us fast um, open your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. Um, with the passing of Queen Elizabeth and the coronation of King Charles, 
uh, royalty has been in the news again. And there's something about royalty that captures the attention of people around the world, and they get excited about it. And I don't know if you've ever thought about meeting royalty, if you've thought about how would you act if you were called to England and were, got to meet uh, the queen or now king, um, or maybe better in our context, if you were called to the White House, uh, what would that be like? What would you wear? What would you say? How would you approach uh, the president? Um, the Kansas City Chiefs got to go to the White House either this week or the week before, and um, while they're standing there, they're waiting for the president to walk out, and Travis Kelsey walks up to the podium, and he's going to say something, and if you know anything about Travis Kelsey, he is not the man you want at the podium at the White House. And so Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback, comes and just takes him by the arm and leads him away from the podium. He's like, Travis, you're not saying anything. Because there are things that are appropriate when you're in the presence of the president or royalty and and things that are not. And his teammates knew that it was very likely that he would say something that wasn't appropriate. Um, But when you come to presenting yourself to the president or presenting yourself to a king, there are things that are appropriate, things that you do a way you should act. And in our passage today, Paul's going to write, and, and as he writes to Timothy, there's uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, do your best to present yourself to God. And it's this idea of, of coming before God. How is it that we are to come before God? What should that look like? And so as we look at this passage this morning, that's what we have in mind. If we're going to come before God, how should we act? And Paul is going to give examples that are negative of what they've seen in the church of Ephesus. And then, of course, tell us what we should do as well. So if you would, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to read uh, verses 14 through 19. 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 19. Paul writes, Remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This is God's word for us this morning. It's perfect. It's holy. It's infallible. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we look at your word that it would penetrate our hearts. God, that you would show us how to love you well, to be more like you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Paul begins this uh, paragraph and he says, remind them of these things. And so he's telling Timothy what he's supposed to remind the church of. And uh, it's to remind them of the things that he's already talked about. And back in verse 8, he wrote, he said, remember Jesus Christ. So he's telling them even there, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as I preached in my gospel. Paul wants them to remember the gospel. And one of the things that is um, true of Christians is that we don't need anything new. The gospel is not progressing. The gospel is not growing. The gospel is not changing. The gospel is consistent. The same gospel that Paul preached is the gospel that we believe. And we don't need new information. Look over quickly at 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you just how, how Peter thought about this, because I think it's, it's important for us to understand this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter writes, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. And so there, as Peter writes, He's saying that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And that life and godliness comes through the knowledge and understanding of who Jesus Christ is, of who God is. 
That, that's all we need. But where, where do we get this knowledge from? Look down at verse 18. So still 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. And Paul says, let me begin in verse 17 so you get the whole context. It says, For when he received honor, talking about Jesus, and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And so Peter's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, where they go up and they hear God proclaim, they hear the voice, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So Peter's saying we were with Jesus on the mountain. And then that is an experience that I think you, had you lived through that, you could go back to time and time again and be like, oh, I believe in God because I was on the mountain. I heard the voice. But look at what Peter says. He says in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word talking about scripture more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy has ever produced was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what Peter is saying there is like, we had this tremendous experience on the mountain, but you know what's more sure? God's prophetic word. And so we as Christians, we're not looking for, you know, a new experience or or a new revelation. We have everything we need. We have everything we need for life and godliness in scripture. And so... As we think about what it is that we need to remember and what going back to 2 Timothy, what Paul is reminding them of is remember what you already know. Go back to that over and over and over again. I know that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but we need to remember that God's word is sufficient, that the gospel is sufficient, that the gospel doesn't change. God's character doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the God that David prayed to in Psalm 61, the the God that Paul preached the gospel of in the New Testament times, and the God that we worship today is exactly the same. So Timothy is to remind them of these things, remind them of the gospel. And it says, and then he's to charge them before God. And here I think we're, we're reminded that we live life in the presence of God when Paul says, I, you're to charge them before God. You're to say, hey, I'm making this proclamation to you in the presence of God. You need to understand that God is real, that God is here, and that you live all of life in the presence of God. And oftentimes we think, well, nobody will know. Well, God will always know because we live all of life in the presence of God. So how should we present ourselves to God? How should we think about living life in the presence of God? Our outline for this morning is pretty easy. It's do, don't, do, don't. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. It's don't, do, don't, do. (laughs) I should have looked at my notes. But he's going to tell us in verse 14, this is what you don't do. And then here's what you do. And then what you don't do and what you do. So let's begin in verse 14 with this first don't. He says, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearer. And so Paul says, you know, life is lived in the presence of God. Charge them before God and don't waste time fighting about what he calls vain words. Thinking back to, to the chiefs at the White House, if you're at the White House and the whole team's there, you wouldn't expect somebody to pull out a deck of Uno cards and say, hey, let's go sit over here and play Uno. You're at the White House. Don't waste time playing a silly game. You have the gospel. Don't waste time talking about things that are frivolous or even worse, things that are going to ruin the hearers. Some people will use a a verse like this to say that we shouldn't have discussions about theology and doctrine. We shouldn't quarrel about words. But there are appropriate discussions to have. And we should be able to discuss them without quarreling. We should be able to to discuss them in grace and kindness toward one another.
one another. Because that's what we do as a church. We're, we're charged to love one another, to care for one another, to be pushing one another to Christ's likeness. And sometimes that's going to mean we have a little bit of different opinion and we talk about that graciously and kindly. But we don't have a difference of opinion on what Tim, Paul told Timothy to remind them of, and that's the gospel. We hold fast to that. There are appropriate times to correct error. Look over at Matthew 22. This is Jesus here, and he's correcting error in verse 29. Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus answered them, You were wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you about God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So Jesus right there says to the Pharisees, you're wrong. And there are times where we have to say, you're wrong. But we do it with grace and kindness. In Acts 15, uh, you have the Jerusalem council where the church leaders gather together and they have to discuss an issue, an issue and they have to make a decision on what they're going to do. How much of the Old Testament law has to be kept to be a Christian? How much are, are Gentiles required to keep? And they have that discussion and that is an appropriate to discussion. What's an inappropriate discussion? What does Paul have in mind here as he talks about not quarreling about words? We'll go back, go back to 1 Timothy. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. This was part of the charge, right? Paul says, I, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our goal is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Then you go to chapter 6, verse 20. And it says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrust to you, entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. So Paul thought it was perfectly appropriate to call out error, to call out what was wrong, to call out where um, the gospel is being changed and what is ruining people's lives. Um, what does that look like in, in our context? Sometimes we just need to, to remind people of, of the gospel. And sometimes we need to say that's not how the universe works. There was, um, I've, I'm getting older and I've lost track of time, but maybe 10 years ago, maybe more than that, um, there was a book came, that came out called The Secret. And The Secret is the law of attraction. If you speak things into the universe, you will attract those things to you. And so if you are all the time going around saying, my life is horrible, nobody loves me, your life is going to be horrible, nobody loves you. But if you go around and saying, I am awesome, and I deserve a better house and a nicer car, and then you will attract those things to you. That's not how the universe works. And we as Christians need to say, no, <laughs> that's not how you become right with the universe. You actually need to become right with God and confess your sins and live in his grace. And we, we've talked before that, you know, about how does God answer prayer? God answers prayer, yes, and my grace is sufficient for you. And we need to live in the sufficiency of his grace. If you're going to present yourself to God, if you're going to come to God and follow God, you have to trust and believe God and the gospel that he has preached and the word that he has given and not get caught up in these trivi trivial, silly things. So that's what we are not to do. That's the don't that we see there in verse 14. Well, what should we do instead? Verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. 
the do your best here, you, you may hear in the sound of a, you know, a little league coach's voice like, do your best, little slugger. That, that is not how Paul writes this. This is what one commentator says. He says, Timothy needs to make Paul's instruc- instructions his highest priority. We might translate this, spare nor no effort, or tackle this no matter what. So when Paul is saying, do your best, he's saying, Timothy, this needs to be primary in what you're doing. Do your best to present yourself to God, to, to um, and then he says, a worker who needs not to be ashamed. So in what you're doing, do it in a way that honors and glorifies God. And you see that a worker who needs no, not be ashamed. I think it's important here that we um, just clarify something. It's don't present yourself as a worker. It's the picture here is not of me saying, okay, I've done all of this work for you, God, and now I'm going to come present it to you, and I hope you will find it okay. Remember what Timothy or Paul told Timothy to remind them of in the beginning. It's the gospel, right? Jesus Christ has done the important work on the cross so that when we come to God, we don't come with our works. We come with what Christ has done for us. We come with his blood and we say, God, I am coming to you knowing that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he covered my blood. And so that's what I come with just asking for your grace and your mercy. And then because you've given me grace and mercy, here's the logical way that we should then come before God and live before God is, is in this. So it's not, this isn't describing a work salvation. This is describing the natural or logical reaction of somebody that has been saved and how they should live. So we're to do our best to present ourselves to God, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. So Paul uses this phrase, present yourself, and he uses it in the idea of giving yourself completely to something. Look over at Romans and look at chapter 6. I want you to see Paul uses this idea of presenting yourself, both in the positive and the negative. We are are presenting ourselves to something. We're giving ourselves to something. We, um, We are exposing ourselves to something, and I think I've used this illustration before, but um, I grew up watching a lot of, of old Western movies, and there, there's always that gunfight, right, where nobody can hit anybody, um, and then they're shooting and everything, and there's always some guy that's standing behind a barrel, and he's hiding, and then what does he do? He gets out, and he starts walking, and then he gets shot, and you're like, stay behind the barrel. Like, why, why is this so hard? Stay behind the barrel. But what does he do when he steps out behind the barrel? He's presenting himself to the enemy and he gets shot. And when I think about the way Paul uses this, this idea of presenting yourself, it's who are you going to give yourself to? Who are you going to allow to have an influence on you? And so look at, as I said, Paul uses this both in the positive and negative. So in Romans six thirteen, he says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And then in verse 19. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And so the picture here is when he talks about, he says you used to present yourselves as members of sin. And so in our old life, we were following the way of the world. We were following our own passions and desires. We were giving ourselves, presenting ourselves to sin. But in coming to faith in Jesus Christ, we repent, we turn, and we put our faith in Jesus. We say, God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I'm going to trust his death to cover my sin, and I am now going to follow you. And so we present ourselves to Christ. Christ. 
But what Paul's warning them here is that sometimes, you know, it's like we're following Christ, but there's still that world, there's still the, the world back there. There's still those things that attract us. And every once in a while, we, we step out from behind the barrel of the cross, right? I hope you're, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but we're, we're, now we're hiding behind the cross if, if we go back to that gun scene, right? But then every once in a while, we go, oh, but that looks good. And we step out and we present ourselves to sin. And we're not to do that. We now, because of the cross, because of what Christ has done in our lives, have the ability to say no to sin. And so we have to keep saying no to it. We present ourselves to God and we have to keep saying, I'm going to give myself to God. I'm going to give myself to God. I'm going to give myself to God. It's why the gospel is not just for somebody that doesn't know Christ, but it's for for Christians as a whole. We keep going back to the gospel. We need the gospel every day. Because the gospel is the good news that Jesus saved us, that Jesus is saving us. He's working in us to, to, produce, to help us to be more like Christ. And he will one day save us in the context of he will one day take us to glory. That that is all gospel. That God walks with us through all of life. Uh, let me show you Paul using this in the positive. Look over at Romans chapter 12, this idea of presenting yourself. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And that spiritual worship could really easily be translated your logical worship. This is the logical thing to do because you've been saved. We're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We're to give ourselves totally to God. And what does that look like? Verse 2 do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So prove what God's will is. Show the world what God's will is as your mind is renewed, as you stop conforming to the world and let God transform you. And notice that he doesn't say that you are transformed. It's, it's that ongoing sanctification, right? It's that ongoing growth to be more like Christ that we're transformed as we renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? By putting our minds on scripture. Back to 2 Timothy. We do our best to present ourselves as one approved, as a worker, as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. How do we present ourselves to God? Well, we, we handle the word well. An approved worker is someone that's been tested and shown to be genuine. That, that idea of genuine is someone you don't need to be ashamed. You're like, this is, this is who I am. I'm handling your word right, God. I, I am following you totally and completely. I'm trusting your word. I'm, I'm following your word. I'm, I'm obeying your word. I believe it. I submit to it. I don't twist it. I don't pervert it. I don't change it. I don't quarrel with it. I think back to to verse 1 where it says quarreling about words. And how many times do we quarrel with Scripture when you come across a verse that just pokes us right where we want to be? You're at work and you're struggling. You're like, oh, just everybody's just, ah, they're, they're, oh, and I'm so angry. And then you're in James that morning. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Yeah, I don't want to read that this morning because I'm going to go light them up when I get there. And so, so we fight. We, we're, not, we're not to do that. We're to submit to his word, to listen to it. If you want to present yourself to God without shame, not ashamed, you obey his word. And I can think of situations where people have said they want to present themselves to God, but they don't want to obey his word. I think of the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus, knowing what's in his heart, knowing the treasure of his heart, says, sell what you have and follow me. And he's like, whoa, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I want to sell everything. Why? Because his, his hope, his security, his satisfaction was in his wealth. And if that goes away, he doesn't think he has anything. But if you have Christ, you have all you need. If you're going to handle God's word rightly, we don't get to change it. We don't get to read it in the way that is best for us. Um, when I was in seminary, Sabina was working full time to, to put me through school. And 
So oftentimes I would do house stuff because I was home. And so she left a note and said, hey, I'm going to be home late. Could you clean this and, and make dinner? I know that my idea of cleanness is very different from her idea of cleanness. And my idea of dinner is, can often be different. So I don't, I could read that note and be like, one wipe on the counter, box of cereal out. We're good. I've cleaned the house. I've prepared dinner. But that's not how we read the note, right? We read trying to understand the intention of the per- person that wrote it. And we should approach God's word the same way. My, my goal is not to take scripture and go, what can I take and find that will, will support what I believe? My word is, what my, my approach is, what did God mean when he wrote his word? And when I discover what he means, then I do it. Because my, my desire is to handle his word rightly, to, be, to present myself to God as a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Because I know if I put cereal on the, on the counter and say, hey, honey, I made dinner, I, I'm not going to get a happy look, right? I'm going to get that, really? That, that's your idea, dinner? And there's going to be shame in my heart. Why should we read God's word with a desire to know him and and his intentions? Because he's the God of the universe that saved us, that knows what's best for us, that has our best in mind. Whatever God asks of us is what is best for us. And so as we approach his word, we need to read it. We need to listen to it. We need to obey it. We need to submit to it. And that is how we present ourselves to God. Not coming to God with our agenda, but we come and we say, can't believe you saved me, but you did. By your grace and your mercy, what can I do for you? That's how we present ourselves to God. Verse 16, he comes back to the way not to come to God, another don't. And again, there's examples from this church in Ephesus that Timothy knows well. In verse 16, he says, but avoid irreverent babble. So if you're going to handle the word word of truth rightly, you need to avoid irreverent babble. And this irreverent babble just leads to more and more ungodliness. And there's something about ungodliness that just draws other ungodly people. We, We find each other, right? They have the same struggles and sins. Weak people or struggling people in the church can get caught up and look at how he describes it he says it becomes their talk will spread like gangrene and gangrene is death of the body tissue due to lack of blood flow or a serious infection and i will not describe to you what gangrene looks like it's it's gross it's nasty and the picture here is that you know it's been these people have been cut off from the body. The blood isn't flowing anymore. They've become isolated. And this sickness is just growing and it's destructive and it's growth, gross, and it, it leads to death. God's word gives life to the church. This irreverent babble brings death and sickness. What is the irreverent babble that he has in mind? He actually tells us here what he has in mind. He mentions two people by name that I'm sure Timothy knew, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And he says that they've swerved from the truth. So they, they've a, they're going off in a different direction and they're upsetting people's faith. And what is it that they're doing to upset people's faith? Is they're saying the resurrection has already happened. And so I had to do, I had to do some more. Like, what does that mean? What, what exactly did they believe And one commentator described it as acute realized eschatology, which isn't really that helpful. But what he's saying is that um, he's saying what they were telling people is that, you know what? When Jesus Christ rose from the dead and you put your faith in Christ, you entered into your resurrected body. And so you're living your resurrected life right now. You're living your best life now. And so what's the practical outcome of that if you tell people you've been resurrected you were with christ this is your best life they go well then it doesn't matter what i do 
And so they were entering into to sin, and some people think that it was this same thing that was going on in the church in Corinth and why you had so many just things that we read and go, how does somebody in the church do that? Well, if they believe they've already, if they're living their best life now, if they've been resurrected and it doesn't matter what you do, why wouldn't you do those things? There's no need to work on becoming more like Christ. There's no need to grow in your Christian faith. There's no need to endure to the end, which is what we talked last week about, right? That was Paul's point, endure to the end, keep going. There's no need to do that if the resurrection has already happened. When we present ourselves to God, we have to avoid buying into these things, avoid the false teaching How do you defend yourself? You do verse 15. You handle the word rightly. You spend time in the word. You take it in your hand. You read it. You try to understand, what what did God mean here? You talk to other people about it. Hey, what are you learning? What what, did you read this week? When irreverent babble comes up, you'll recognize it. Avoid those things. And I thought about trying to give you a list, but it's like, there's so many things on the list. <laughs> and so the best thing to do is like, rather than try to figure out what all the wrong stuff is out there, just know God's word. And when somebody, somebody comes and says, hey, I read this great book, The Secret, you should read it. It's the law of it. You'll just be like, I know that's not true. <laughs> We're to handle God's word rightly. We're to avoid irreverent babble. It just upsets people's faith. It takes them from the truth. It causes them to swerve from the truth. And we need to be holding fast to the truth as as best we can. And then what's the last thing? Verse 19, Paul finishes up the paragraph by writing in the positive. And next week, we're we're going to play this out a little bit more as as he writes the next part. But he makes this promise to them. God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. He gives them two things. The first statement is, the Lord knows those who are his. And then, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. We have a firm foundation in God's character and God's word. And then he tells us this. The Lord knows who are his. This is a quote from Numbers 16.5, when Korah rebelled against Moses. And God comes in and he judges and he he wipes out all of the people that rebelled. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in that camp right then. And you've got the people that followed Moses, the people that rebelled against Korah. And you're kind of one of those people that was maybe in the middle or maybe you doubt, like maybe you were doubting Moses a little bit. I I, I don't know, is Moses leading us the right right way? How do I know that God won't accidentally wipe me out too? Because God knows who are his. There's no doubt in God's mind who are his. God never acts unjustly. God never acts unrighteously. God never judges someone and then goes, oh, sorry, I had some bad DNA evidence. No, God always makes the proper and right decision. And so his, his encouragement to these people that are living in this church where you've got people teaching false things and they're thinking, am am I accidentally believing the wrong thing? Am I, ah, I'm just not sure. Am I really a Christian? Paul's encouragement is, you know what? Trust God. He knows who are his. Keep enduring. Keep trying to handle God's word well, but ultimately trust God's character. Trust God's word. He knows who are his. And then that's, that's the huge comfort there, but that's also a warning. God knows who are his. And if you're just faking it, God knows who are his. And he will judge one day. It's a warning to Hymenaeus and, and Philetus. God knows who are his. He knows who what is in, this, in their hearts. And so Paul finishes with that, but mostly, I think, just to be an encouragement to Timothy. 
Because there are times in our life where, where we doubt and we don't feel like we're walking well with God. And God says, forget what you feel. Go to what you know. You've placed your faith in Christ. He has promised to forgive. Trust God. He knows who are his. And then the last statement is really a, what we would have said back in when I was a kid as a well duh statement. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Iniquity is unrighteousness. I, unrighteousness is not acting rightly. If you're going to follow God, you don't get to do your own thing. If you're going to say, Jesus is my Savior and my King, you don't then get to do whatever you want to. There, there's a call to obedience. So if you're going to name the name of the Lord, depart from iniquity. If you're going to say, I'm a Christian, live like it. Act that way. If you're going to name the name of the Lord, stop sinning. And I, and I say that knowing that we're all going to continue to sin, but battle sin. And if it's, you know, just ongoing sin, you're not battling, stop. Start battling it. If you want to judge whether something is irreverent babble, irreverent babble or from God, one of the things you look at is, is it encouraging me to sin or is it telling me to stop? Tim Challies has a great article um, on his website, challies.com. And I would, it's a great uh, website to go to. But he, there's an article called False Teachers and Deadly Doctrine. And he gives eight this is the title is eight terrible consequences of false doctrine is this section. He gives, he gives eight things. I, th- I thought this was helpful as we think about um, avoiding irreverent babble and just all the things we face. He, was, he says, number one, false doctrine confuses truth and error while sound doctrine distinguishes truth and error. False doctrine pre- prevents ungod. I'm sorry. False doctrine prevents godliness while so- sound doctrine promotes godliness number three false doctrine promotes sin while sound doctrine prevents sin false doctrine elevates ungodly leadership while sound doctrine qualifies godly leadership number five false doctrine permits false teachers while sound doctrine protects against false teachers false false doctrine removes god's blessing while sound doctrine ensures god's blessing False doctrine debilitates the church for times of difficulty, while sound doctrine equips the church for times of difficulty. And the last one, false doctrine weakens the future church, while sound doctrine strengthens the future church. Now, I thought that was how, if you want to know whether something is irreverent babble, is it pointing you to Christ or is it pointing you away from Christ? Is it giving you excuses to sin or is it helping you to walk in holiness. Paul's Paul's final point as he wraps this up is trust God's character and stop sinning. And he puts those choices squarely before Timothy. And this is his his encouragement to Timothy. It's Timothy, you got to choose. Are you going to be like Hymenaeus and, and Philetus? Are you going to get caught up in that or are you going to follow God? Are you going to hold his word rightly? And Paul's desire and Paul's hope and what he knows of Timothy is Timothy wants to live the right way. And so he says, Timothy, do this. Handle God's word rightly. So the question for us this morning, I think, is is how will you live? How will you present yourself to God? How will you handle his word? We had a men's breakfast speaker a couple years ago that said, what you do with this book over the next five years will determine who you are. I like that. If you leave it on a shelf, it's not going to, going to have much impact on you. If you spend time in it, it will transform your life. If you don't know who God is and you spend time in this, you will come to know God. You will come to know the gospel. You will come to know that you can be saved of your sins just by placing your faith in Christ. If you spend time in this word where you feel weak, God will strengthen you in his might. So the question for us is, as Christians, are how are we handling this? Are we submitting to it? Are we following it? Are we obeying it? 
Or are we fighting against it? Are we quarreling with it? Are we ignoring it? The Bible is an amazing gift of God's grace. It's amazing that the God of the universe would choose to speak to us and give us a book that he, whereby we could say, I know who God is and what he wants because he's told me here. It's simply a gift of God's grace. And as we think, how do we as Christians want to follow God? We follow God well by handling this book well, by listening to his words, to following it. In this book, we have access to our creator. In this book, we have access to our savior, our sustainer. We have access to the one with who we will spend eternity together. Let's not be people who get caught up in all kinds of trivial side things and crazy ideas. Let's be people that handle God's word rightly. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for the salvation that you give us through Jesus Christ. And God, we can get busy in so many different things, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just give us a deep desire and a deep heart to know you more, to spend time in your word, not as a task or as a chore, God, but just spend time delighting in your character and in your person, Lord. We thank you for your word. Help us to live in it. In Jesus' name, amen. While the band comes, spend a little bit of time in talking with the Lord, just what he has put on your heart. And if you'd like to pray with someone, there will be a few of us here at the front. Um, as always, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, one of us would love to talk with you, as would pretty much anybody here. Uh, but don't leave here without trusting Christ to forgive you of your sins. All right? Take a moment and talk with the Lord. Would you guys stand with us as we worship together?
conclude our service. There we go. Let me conclude our service uh, by reading Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. All we need is Christ. That concludes our service. If you would have a seat for a minute, though, I'm going to ask for uh, about two more minutes of your time. Um, We're going to go into a, a quick business meeting. I promise this will